a resentful royal duke in exile, a deeply damaging crisis for the monarchy, and embarrassing squabbles about money, titles and security. But that barely scratches the surface of the uncanny list of parallels between the 1936 abdication of the Duke of Windsor and the ongoing Megxit fallout. On the evening of December 10, speaking for the last time as King, Edward VIII announced to the nation that he had abdicated and would now quit altogether public affairs to be with the woman he loved, American divorcee Wallace Simpson. Like Prince Harry, he was good-looking, popular, charismatic and made no secret of his desire to sweep away stuffy traditions and modernize the monarchy. The first dispute was over security. The palace felt the Duke of Windsor should pay for it himself. Threats were made to withdraw protection from Mrs. Simpson. In the event, the Windsors prevailed and retained security until their deaths unlike Harry and Meghan who must now pay for their own protection in California. Even more serious were the arguments over finances. At the abdication, it had been agreed that the Duke would receive 25000 a year, the annual annuity for a younger brother of a sovereign. But it was discovered the ex-king had not been open about his financial situation and was far wealthier than he had claimed. Likewise, Harry complained on TV that his father had cut him off financially. Money would be a source of continuing resentment for the former king, in particular with his brother King George VI. What had been a close bling relationship disintegrated, not helped by the fact that the new Queen Elizabeth, later the Queen Mother, and Wallace Simpson did not like each other. Elizabeth dismissively referred to the Duchess of Windsor as that woman. Wallace gave her sister-in-law the demeaning nickname Cookie. It seems history is repeating itself with the rift between brothers Harry and William extending to their wives, as seen in the Who Made Who Cry argument before the Sussexes' wedding. When Edward saw his relations, it was without his wife, which now seems to be Harry's position too. Over the years there were constant tensions as George VI felt his older brother was trying to upstage him. Today we see similar competitiveness in the social media announcements of the Sussexes and the Cambridges. In 1937, the Windsors announced their wedding date on the eve of George's coronation. Two years later, as Britain prepared for war with Nazi Germany, the Duke made an incendiary speech in favor of appeasement, just as his brother left on a US tour designed to win American support. Both Dukes in exile were highly critical of their fathers. Then there were also tensions throughout the family. As Harry complained that Prince Charles was a bad parent, so the Duke of Windsor told the writer James Pope Hennessy, my father had a most horrible temper. He was foully rude to my mother. At the funeral of his mother in March 1953, the Duke wrote to Wallace, what a smug, stinking lot my relations are and you've never seen such a seedy, worn out bunch of old hags. Then there was the thorny question of status. The Duke was devastated when his position of Colonel-in-Chief of the Welsh Guards was withdrawn. One can imagine that Harry, whose army service had been transformative, felt much the same when he was forced to surrender his honorary military titles. But many of the disagreements centered around Wallace's status. The Duke was determined she should be HRH, the royal family were equally adamant that she should not. Apart from their concerns that the marriage wouldn't last, they felt that it totally undermined the point of the abdication. George VI was clear when he wrote to Prime Minister Winston Churchill in December 1942, when he abdicated, he renounced all the rights and privileges of succession for himself and his children. This has been a bone of contention for the Sussexes too. They retain their HRH status at the moment, while undertaking not to use it commercially, but they clearly fear their children Archie and Lilibet will be denied titles. Meghan raised the matter in their Oprah interview. Embarrassing public pronouncements is something else the two royals in exile have in common. The Duke of Windsor's Narve political views, particularly his pro-Nazi sympathies, caused deep concern in political and intelligence circles. It was felt that the ambitious and clever Wallace was guiding her weak and gullible husband, 
a feeling some share about Harry's new woke agenda, accusing his family of racism and urging green initiatives after traveling by private jet. A continuing theme in the Windsor's exile would be their desire to use the media to control their narrative, while making money. A week after the abdication, a series of articles on the couple appeared in American newspapers, written by Wallace's second cousin Newbold Noyes. He had been given the use of an office at Buckingham Palace and full cooperation, but that did not stop Wallace repudiating his work, and claiming that she had not invited him to Britain, they were not related and she had not approved the articles. The denials of Harry and Meghan's cooperation with their very supportive biographer Omid Scobie therefore have a certain resonance. The Windsors took a series of legal actions against the press, and also sued the author Jeffrey Dennis for suggesting they had slept together before marriage. It was true, but the Duke still won his case. Harry's eagerly anticipated memoirs will not be the first autobiography by a senior royal. In 1950, the Duke published A King's Story, earning him 300,000, the equivalent of 9.6 million now. Six years later Wallace published The Heart Has Its Reasons, and received the equivalent of 9 million. Both books were ghost-written by journalist Charles Murphy after Wallace's previous writer, Cleveland Amory, resigned on the grounds of the Duchess's mendaciousness. Plans for a Duchess of Windsor etiquette book fell through when no publisher would come up with a 36,000 fee now 1 million. Throughout their exile, the Windsors gave interviews to print and broadcast media, which were not always helpful to the royal family notably a series of articles by Wallace in McCall's magazine where she spoke of how, my husband has been punished like a small boy who gets a spanking every day of his life for a single transgression. In June 1960 they were persuaded by an advisor not to sign a contract for a TV series in which the Duke would re-enact the abdication speech. Shortly afterwards he did just that in a documentary made up of old newsreels and interviews, interspersed with footage of him reciting passages from his autobiography. It supposedly netted him, the equivalent of 2.5 million now. One wonders what Harry and Meghan may still have in store as part of their multi-million pound Netflix deal. The Windsors' interviews were given in the US where the Windsors, like the Sussexes, mixed freely with American celebrities. They choose to spend half the year there, taking an apartment in New York and regularly staying with friends in Florida and California. They were happy to attend events, often with a secret fee attached, and sponge off rich Americans and foreign aristocrats. As with the Sussexes, many of the Windsors' old friends dropped away or were abandoned. Fruity Metcalf, the Duke's best man and long-standing friend, was simply left stranded one night in Paris shortly before the German invasion and had to hitch his way home. Rosa and George Wood, who had followed the couple to the Bahamas, were cut off when they announced at the end of the Duke's appointment as governor of the islands that they wanted to return home. One thinks of all Harry's long-standing friends who have been cold-shouldered. Then there were the allegations about Meghan's treatment of staff. The Windsors were said to have treated their staff in an entitled and unforgiving manner. Their ghost writer, Murphy, remembered, a dropped plate, a careless intrusion, a slip in attentiveness could be counted upon to bring a swift dressing down, followed often by peremptory sacking. The Windsors continued to live an extravagant lifestyle with several homes and an extensive staff, dressed in a specially designed livery. Such extravagance was unpopular in 1950s Britain where even basic essentials were still rationed. And they had no compunction about commercially exploiting their royal status. Apart from book deals and the paid interviews, the Duke charged to be photographed watching the 1953 coronation, they advertised everything from cutlery to dress collections. It was clear they would never be accepted back into the royal family, a situation that threatens to develop with the Sussexes. Cecil Beaton noted in his diary after seeing the Windsors in the 1950s, he has no interests. He thought he was bored at being royalty and he has no reason since to consider he has stopped being bored. He has no intellect. The Windsors continued their aimless, empty lives until the Duke's death in 1972 and hers 12 years later. 
Far from being one of the great love stories of the 20th century, it was a sad story of a weak man hijacked by a strong woman. It's a high-risk life choice, and the lessons are still evident. Traitor King, The Scandalous Exile of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor by Andrew Loney, Blink, 25, is published on Thursday. For free postage and packing, call Express Bookshop on 020-3176-3832.